So advanced heart failure is it's a bit of an unusual terminology in that what it means is that um, when heart failure itself has got to a certain stage that beyond which standard therapy isn't working anymore. So to kind of answer that question, I'd probably strip it back to the, the very basics and say, well, what is heart failure? Um, to patients, it's a condition by which the squeezing function um, uh, of the main pumping part of the heart has become weakened. And that usually leads to them feeling breathless. Um, usually sometimes leads to feelings of heavy legs or swollen legs and they can't do as much as they did before. What we know is that has an enormous impact upon quality of life, but also it has an impact upon how long people may live. So it's a very serious condition. And so and we, we take it uh, with the same seriousness. We, we look at it in a very systematic way to look at what therapies can be offered, um, either by tablet treatments, psychological support, exercise therapy, and sometimes what we use is, is other device-based things like and pacemakers or defibrillators and that's what we call standard heart failure therapy and when someone's gone through all of those steps yet still they have serious problems um, and are very limited then we have to think about advanced therapy beyond that which includes things like mechanical circulatory support um, but the most famous uh, part of that that people might recognize is something called heart transplantation um, I've been very fortunate in my training that I've been uh, trained in all aspects of general cardiology, but I specifically enjoyed heart failure and so started uh, training in general heart failure and then did further training beyond that in advanced heart failure, mechanical support and heart transplantation. So the signs of advanced heart failure were um, essentially the same as um, any patient who might experience heart failure. So usually breathlessness, um, sometimes trouble with sleeping, using more pillows at night time, noticing ankle swelling or feelings of heavy leggedness, or sometimes when you see the, the kind of rim uh, on, on your ankle when your socks become too tight. Um, these are the kind of main subtle things, but the, the things that I think is really important to look out for is depending upon someone's age, because in my standard practice, I see people of all ages, so they might be in their 80s or 90s, but some of them are in their teens or early 20s. And so if you're a younger patient, often you don't experience symptoms nearly so obviously. And so we have to be quite diligent with looking at things like that um, and, and ensuring that we aren't missing an opportunity to help someone where we can. So having advanced heart failure in itself isn't generally painful. Um, I think uh, it does depend on why someone might have heart failure. So the commonest reason uh, in the UK why someone might have heart failure is usually from having had a heart attack or heart muscle damage that has then weakened the pumping function. And if someone's con continuing to experience problems with um, blood vessels, then they may experience angina, but the heart failure situation itself is not usually painful. The typical features of, of heart failure are usually breathlessness and what we call fluid overload or swelling, gaining weight. But that in itself is, is quite an interesting situation because the other things that people don't often attribute to heart failure in terms of symptoms are things like um, abdominal swelling, noticing their, their, um, their trousers becoming tighter, sometimes some pain in the upper parts of the abdomen where we see the, the liver and the spleen because there can be stretching of the capsule around those organs which can be very uncomfortable. Um, and the same reason, commonly we find that people actually have some, some fluid gathering in the small bowel in the, in the upper part where we, where we see that the stomach is. This is very well recognised and actually people then uh, experience things like sometimes bloating or they feel that they're not very hungry anymore. So appetite dropping is a very important sign to look for. Um, similarly, for various um, important mechanisms that are very well understood now, we actually recognise that people become anemic. Um, um, and then an and iron deficient um, uh, anemia is a reasonably common thing that we see and that then becomes a target for certain therapies for heart failure. Other things that you might experience, things like itching of the skin perhaps if there's been some liver trouble um, and sometimes people might notice a, a changing of skin colour for similar reasons. Um, the other things that we would always want to ask patients to look out for is making sure they're passing enough water and that the water that they pass out um, is a normal colour and that it's not um, smelling unusual to them uh, or there's no pink tinges or that signs that there might be any forms of blood loss from anywhere. 
Well, heart failure in itself um, is a serious condition. And when we look at the evidence and the statistics, the um, life expectancy of someone with a new diagnosis of heart failure is similar to having a new diagnosis of colorectal cancer. And in fact, only um, lung cancer and pancreatic cancer actually have worse outcomes. So it's something that should be taken very seriously. It doesn't get given enough um, uh, support or research money to, to try and tackle this problem. But that being said, the, the average that we quote people is around 50% mortality at five years, which sounds very, very nasty and very, very unpleasant. Some people can live for far longer, but I think what, we, what I often speak to people about is not necessarily how long someone lives for, but it's how they live their life that often matters to them and their family. So there are therapies that we give people that can reduce mortality and extend life expectancy. Um, but we mustn't forget that it's how we get there that matters as well. And, that, and that's something that I pride myself um, on looking at in every patient every day. So um, the treatments for heart failure, the, the very basics include education for patients, understanding the condition, knowing what's wrong with them. And, and in their particular case, how did they end up with heart failure? As I said, most people have heart failure because of blood vessel problems, but there's lots of patients who don't have blood vessel problems, who may have inherited problems, cardiomyopathies, and other reasons for heart muscle weakening. And importantly, when we think of those patients, we also have to think about, does that affect other members of their family as well? And, and look at it more holistically as a, as a family experience rather than just that patient experience as well. Once we've kind of gone through those basic parts, we, we treat people with um, what's now called the, the four pillars of therapy, which is a combination of um, something called Sucubitral Valsartan as the probably most up-to-date um, medication in that classification, um, beta blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, um, and something called SGLT2 inhibitors, which are the newest addition um, to the uh, drug therapy. Um, they have been shown to improve um, the functions of hearts uh, and also to, uh, to help uh, reduce mortality events. On top of that, we also have sim uh, symptom-based therapies, usually things that people will think about called water tablets or diuretics, which will minimize the amount of extra fluid in the body and generally help make people feel better day to day. And the skill of, of looking after someone with heart failure is trying to manage those medications with those problems and helping them understand how to take things, when they should take them, balancing out blood pressure and heart rate problems but not forgetting that these patients are likely to have other conditions, maybe things like gout or kidney problems or arthritis, and, and they'll be on other medications for other things, and we have to be there to support them with these drugs and helping them balance that problem with the other things they also take. Beyond that, we think about, you know, um, things that we can measure on ECGs that might help us allow people to benefit from defibrillator therapy. But once we've got to that stage and once we've gone beyond that, what, one of the things that I do quite a lot of is usually something called a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which will evaluate the specific function of the heart's ability to work with the lungs, to extract oxygen from the lungs and deliver that oxygen as a fuel source to the body. And that's actually something that's quite, a, quite an easy thing to do. It's usually on a bicycle um, with a mask that's worn over the mouth to measure the expelled uh, gases and that tells us from that how much oxygen is going into your muscles and uh, organs of your body. Um, that coupled with um, something called biomarkers, a specific biomarker called N-terminal pro-BMP allows us to work out whether someone's symptom decline, usually breathlessness, if that's due to reducing cardiac function. Um, understanding the, the problem is, uh, again, further probably with the utilisation of something called a cardiac MRI scan um, and invasive investigations of which um, uh, I have a, a particular interest and uh, expertise in, something called right heart catheterization allows us to invasively measure uh, function of the heart, but also um, extra pressure or elevated pressure within the lungs, which would um, allow us to know that um, hearts are going to struggle to pump blood to the lungs uh, and deliver that around the body. Those measurements together allow us to know whether someone's going to manage well 
with something called heart transplantation or a new heart, or whether they would actually require um, mechanical machines called ventricular assist devices to help assist them either as um, um, a temporary stopgap measure in hospital when they become very unwell. But some of these patients are actually able to have a mechanical device, such as a, something called an LVAD or a left ventricular assist device, which is a can be a durable device that can actually be implanted in the body and batteries that can be uh, can power the device from the outside and they can actually be ambulant outside walking around playing golf uh, and doing many many activities going to work whilst actually being awaiting a, a heart transplant being on the routine heart transplant list so I think that that's such an exciting thing for me. I, I find it's a, a, a blessing every day when you find there's an opportunity to help some of these problems because when we go back to what we said at the beginning about the, the statistics and how grim and how gloomy it can sound to have a diagnosis of heart failure, to then actually be able to sit someone down and say, this is how we can help you. We're here to help you. This is what we can do. These are the therapies that are there for you. What we have to do is tailor your situation to the therapies that you need and then keep supporting you through this, answering your questions, that of your family. And generally, when we do that, uh, there'll be ups and downs, there'll be good and there'll be bad days, but we're there to help you. Um, and generally the journey together is a, is a pretty positive one.